What is up, everybody, and welcome to Money Legos, a podcast about global economic freedom and the builders making it a reality. I'm Greg Brainerd, and I'm excited to bring you this conversation with Bo Jang. You can find him on Twitter at Bo Ling J. That's B O L I N G J. Bo is the co founder and CEO of Lithic, a platform which offers insanely fast card issuing. Lithic has raised over $100 million from investors like Stripe, Bessemer, Index, and others. Previously, Bo was an engineer at Hatch Labs and a student at MIT where he studied applied mathematics. Bo, how are you doing? Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Yeah, very excited to, to get into to Lithic and some of your background. Just to start us off, can you tell us a little bit about your background and, and how you first started privacy.com, which has then become Lithic? You can you know lock it to the merchant, make it single use and so on. Um, and privacy has continued to grow uh, and has done well, but in, in the process of building privacy, we ended up actually having to build a ton of infrastructure around issuing cards, moving money, working with bank partners, Visa, MasterCard, and so on. And in the process, uh, we basically had this developed this point of view that a lot of the reason why um, banking works the way it does and payments works the way it does is because the underlying infrastructure that powers our banking system in the U.S. is is um, like built thirty or forty years ago, and so we ended up building our initial processor, which is basically the the platform, the system that like processes like incoming credit card, debit card transactions. And you fast forward a couple of years, realize that tons of other people need this as well, and decided to kind of spin it out as a uh, standalone business line, same entity, but it's a different brand. What year? What year was this when you started Privacy? We started Privacy in 2014. Uh, so awesome. by startup standards, we're, we're I'd say, middle-aged now. <laughs> and uh, I'm not sure when, like, Apple Pay kind of came around. Apple Pay is kind of like one of my favorite fintech products where you can issue, it issues a new card, essentially, that auto-fills with the transaction amount at every merchant that you pay with. Um, and... Um, it's like a single use kind of digital virtual card. Um, so the merchant never gets your, your credit card, you know, information and it, you won't be subject to data, you know, data leaks and things like that. And so, um, was this around the time that, that Apple pay was coming out or was, was Apple pay already out? Um, like I, and I, I guess the question is like, was this kind of an innovation yeah. on, on your part, um, that now today is, has obviously gained a lot of adoption. Yeah, so Apple Pay uh, launched around the same time. And I, I'd say they kind of approached it from a different perspective where Apple Pay sits on top of uh, your regular credit or debit card and makes a lot, you know, their focus has been a lot more um, in-person and mo mobile purchases. And they've done a really good job, but, you know, prior to launching the Apple Card, they weren't really operating at the the issuing card level, um, so it's kind of a layer on top of everything else, and a slightly different approach. But yeah, it definitely definitely secures the transaction and uh, is a really convenient way to pay pay for things. Um, it was roughly the same time, though. I think one of the most interesting things about Lithic is that it started as this consumer, you know, fintech platform that you then realized you had built this really great infrastructure that fulfilled a need in the market um, and then you were able to spin out that business and that that's what's become lithic what were you thinking at the time and was privacy.com you know experiencing growth was it slowing down um, and then what made you you know confident to to make that jump into doing the the issuing platform full time yeah so we were at a point in time where like the business was growing but we were seeing like pull in certain segments where uh really high activity or uh really high demand of like basically people reaching out and saying hey can we have access to your api and for a really long time, you know, the, the mantra on startups is like, you want to be super focused, right? And like, if you're building a consumer product, just build the consumer product. Don't distract yourself with like other new features and stuff like that. But like, we were getting so much demand that we were like, okay, like, let's run this as an experiment. And initially, we called it the privacy card issuing API. And 
uh, launched an API under that kind of uh, overall umbrella. And eventually it was like, hey, like this thing that we started off as like a bit of a like side project in some ways is now like becoming like a lot bigger than the, the original offering. And uh, I'd say like, you know, people talk about finding product market fit in a bunch of different ways. Um, and sometimes like folks ask like, hey, how did you guys find product market fit initially? And it's like, honestly, like, it was like totally pulled out of us. Like we were resistant for a really long time about like productizing our, our infrastructure because it was going to be distracting and whatnot. Um, but ended up ended up just kind of going with it uh, as the, the business just grew and became kind of too, too big to ignore. Uh, the other thing I'd say is like the, part of the reason we initially decided to try it out was like we had our own experience working with a legacy third party issuer processor. And it was so painful that we just thought, hey, like, you know, this is something that we have a point of view on and think that we can do better. Mm -hmm. How long had you been working on privacy.com before starting the, was it the privacy.com issuing platform? I forget what you said it was called. Yeah, it was, the, it was the card issuing platform. And we, I think, I want to say we started probably around 2018 or 2019, roughly. What did you think of the, the competitive landscape at the time? Um, you know, there are some other, other names in card issuing. And today it seems like a lot of the, the banking as a service providers offer card issuing as, as a feature. Was that something you thought about? I mean, clearly the, the product market fit, as you said, was kind of pulled out of, pulled out of you rather than you trying to force a product onto the market. Um, and so what do you think was the gap in the market at the time from, from some of the other providers who were doing issuing? Our point of view was really, uh, there's two problems and they're really simple problems. One is it, it's way too hard and way too expensive to launch a new card program. Uh, it costs us on the, it costs us well over a million dollars, took us like 12 to 18 months to get to market. Uh, just super, super painful process all around. The second was um, even after you get up and running, and this is like, this is a little bit more unique to us, but over time, as we've talked to more and more, pro more, more companies, like we've found that, hey, like it's, it's kind of this in one form or, or another, but like even after you get launched and over that like 18 month hurdle and million or more in investment, it's really hard to scale on these legacy platforms because things are constantly breaking. Uh, you're, you're trying to do a relatively novel use case or you're trying to, oftentimes you're trying to differentiate in some, in one way or another. And, um, the legacy players at least are really kind of hardwired for certain use cases. Like if I am, um, XYZ big bank and I want to send like a million pieces of plastic to, you know, people all over the country, like, then that's all I want to do. I don't really want to innovate on anything else. Like, you know, the, the incumbents have gotten actually really good at that. Uh, but the minute you start to introduce something like kind of novel, like, you know, blocking certain transactions because, you know, um, they're, they're higher risk or um, setting up rules that are contextually relevant and, you know, change based on, you know, where, where the card's being used, like stuff like that gets really hard to support and um, really messy. And so that our, our differentiator, as simple as it sounds, is like we're going to make it way easier, insanely fast to launch and we're gonna scale really well with you. And when I think about like that, um, I think about that as like a relatively different segment than what we're doing in the sense that um, if you are looking to uh, bolt on a bank account to your offering, or if you're, you're looking to offer that full suite, Bass is the right solution for you. And we'll, we'll help fill one piece of that. And so we work with Bass providers and, and others and, and partner on sort of the, the specific card issuing piece, but uh, I don't think of us as really kind of a, a bass provider. So I understand the the issues with with the legacy providers. Um, I mean, I was I was more familiar with with a company called Marketa, which was one of the um, newer kind of card issuing platforms for for companies that wanted to start a card program. How big of a threat do you think they were at the time? Did you got were you guys worried about them as an as a player in the market that existed, or was it a different customer set, or or did you execute in in a different way that you know maybe otherwise differentiated the business at the time and even today? 
Uh, Marquetta is focused on a relatively small set of customers. And for us, the idea wasn't that like, hey, like we're going to go and be like, you know, 10% better than Marquetta or Fiserv or someone else that's doing like, you know, card issuing for enterprises. It was really more this idea of like, if you look at the most exciting companies in the world that have been built in fintech in the past, you know, decade or so, um, I actually think they're they're more on the acquiring side. Uh, companies like Square, Stripe, and Adyen, um, and Ad- Adyen's a little earlier um, was built built earlier, but like the the notion of like kind of making it easier to do things uh, and faster to do things, unlocking new TAM was really exciting to us. And so we didn't want to go and rebuild the same wheel. It was, it was really sort of like, how can we enable like much more new new use cases, especially as like, you know, software is eating the world and uh, payments is going more and more digital and like, you know, people want to stop using checks and, and ACH and so on. What were the changes you made to the organization as you were navigating the switch between a consumer you know, facing platform to a B2B card issuing platform. You know, I imagine you had to spin up completely new kind of go to market channels and adjust hiring and other organizational elements uh, in making that that D to C to to B to B switch. How did you manage that? It was difficult. Uh, you know, the reason why people say you want to be focused as a startup is because it's just like you know, it's you have a small team and it's hard to tell like what success looks like if people are working on a bunch of different things. Ultimately, what we settled on is like the model is like privacy is basically a customer of Lithic and that allows people to have like dedicated focus and clear goals and objectives that, that you know, are, are kind of aligned like towards one business line. And so um, that's, that's the model that we've kind of settled on today. Um, you know, early on, it was kind of like everyone's kind of working on everything and uh, the infra team is kind of one infra team, but uh, we, we've kind of separated it out now. And it's there's there's probably more that we could be doing, but uh, broadly, that's kind of the mental model that that uh, I operate operate in. Yeah, was the was the board and, and investors all supportive of of kind of the new direction? And when did it become clear to you that this was where Lithic was was going going to head? Um, I'm curious if there are any kind of conversations, you know, folks who maybe were consumer investors didn't want to do the B2B stuff or, um, or were folks supportive, you know, along the way. On the whole, like our investor base was actually like very supportive the whole way, uh, in part just because like the, the data is like pretty irrefutable <laughs> and, uh, we were pretty methodical about the, the approach, um, and it was just, it was clear the, the ROI was, was there, uh, is basically how I put it. Um, in terms of like when we really made the call, I'd say it was like sometime between the Series A and Series B. Um, and so, yeah, like it, to you know, our investors' credit, many of them invested in a consumer payments company and have been very much on board uh, with, sort of, with the transition, and, and folks were very supportive. That's great. Yeah, I think you rebranded in 20, 2021-ish as Lithic. Yeah. Um, what is what is Lithic mean? I'm I'm curious. Where did the name come from? The name Lithic is you know relating to like stone like substance, uh, and and how we came up with it, with it is like we wanted this notion of like kind of a like reliable foundational because um, because the branding and the messaging is around like kind of insanely fast and like you know easy to get going, but Uh, We wanted the name to be like something where like, you know, people felt like they could trust it. And it's like very foundational because we do operate like mission critical infrastructure for many of our customers. And I have to kind of plug, uh, we we worked with an agency uh, called 100 Monkeys and uh, they basically came up with a bunch of names for us. And uh, I wish there was a more uh, dramatic story, but like it resonated, Lithic resonated the most with us. And um we ended up being able to get the dot com for a pretty reasonable price. That's great. Yeah. Well, it's it's a good name. Um, <clears throat> I was thinking about names a lot just when I was starting Money Legos, and once I found Money Legos, it was one of those things which kind of just stuck. And I was like, okay, this is 
I don't know how someone's not made a podcast called this before, but it was it was something that I was pretty pumped about. Yeah, it's a, it's a good name. <laughs> Thank you. Who are the types of customers that you work with at Lithic? So in general, uh, we work with companies that are that uh, are either payments companies or um, have have some degree of kind of investment in payments. Uh, so the most obvious ones that come to mind immediately are spend management companies or neo banks. Um, for example, uh, Mercury uh, and, and Novo. Um, you know, other aside from that, like there are a bunch of software companies that have payments as an integral part of their offering, and you know that can range from like uh, OTAs, so um, you know companies that uh, will collect payment from you uh, and then use a virtual card on the back end to to book uh, to book the mm-hmm. and fulfill the actual purchase, um, to vertical software companies that make it really easy for companies to you know, manage procurement and spending. One of the distinguishing features about Lithic, at least, at least in the marketing and just what I've heard from, from folks in the industry is that it's really developer forward and focused on being a very easy to integrate and fast developer infrastructure that, that you can go and plug in to power your, your card program. You know why is that, and and how have you cultivated that that reputation in the industry? I think a lot of the reason is really around like we we built a product that we ourselves would have wanted. Uh, we're, we're developers. We've used a legacy pl- platform before and and struggled with that integration process. And um, you know since we were building something from the ground up, um, we we had a lot of latitude in terms of like kind of figuring out like hey there's a better way to do this or hey we should document this in a way that's really clear to developers and uh, product teams. And I think the other thing is uh, building an issue process is really, really hard and doing so at scale is super tough. And uh, when you look at the number of companies that have actually built a modern issue or processor in the past 10 years, um, there's actually not all that many. Uh, most of the folks in the market have been around since you know the early 2000s or, or even earlier. Yeah, so Lithic is really it has the benefit of being built in the past, you know, five years and the, the benefits that come with that are that it's probably a more, more updated technology stack and more, um, yeah, easy to use for, for developers who are, you know, in today's world and using today's tools. Yeah. You know, for example, like a lot of, uh, a lot of incumbent folks aren't built on the cloud. Um, and so there's, you have to spend a tremendous amount of time. Uh, you know, sometimes mm-hmm. you have to like, you know, set up a new uh, server, physical server for uh, to, to onboard a new program, uh, which is, you know, sounds mind boggling, but is is true. You know, I think one of the most kind of interesting things about the business is that is how quickly it's scaled. And I think, you know, maybe we've kind of already touched on why that is. And it's it's fast, it's developer friendly, it's easy to integrate. But how have you approached building a business and you and the team approach building a business that can scale quickly and can scale up to meet customer needs and um, take in a lot of customers, you know, at the same time and onboard them in a, in a quick way? We had the benefit of launching off of the infrastructure that we built for ourselves as privacy. And the second thing that's really nice is um, there's a really nice, quick feedback loop of having uh, a customer internally where um, if we launch something and it breaks, uh, we of course hear from customers, but we also hear really quickly uh, from, from internal customers. And so you have this really quick feedback loop and allows you to move a little bit faster uh, without breaking things, um, at least breaking things too often. Yeah. Yeah, that mission critical infrastructure you hear pretty quickly when when things stop working. Exactly, uh, and a lot of it just comes down to being able to uh, deploy changes relatively quickly, making those investments. And you know, one thing we've been pretty disciplined about is like continuing to like make those investments. You know, not not sort of uh, standing still. What's coming down the pipe for for Lithic? Any kind of upcutting? You know stuff in the product roadmap or 
um, you know, anything you're looking forward to kind of as a business that's, uh, that you're comfortable sharing, at least at, at this point? One of our uh, core beliefs uh, starting out is the future of fintech infrastructure is going to be a lot more modular, uh, kind of like the name Money Legos. Um, and so one thing we're really excited about is like continuing to like lean into that theme and seeing how we can work more closely with other best in breed infrastructure providers. I think that's going to be something that's going to become increasingly important because you're going to ha- you by working with different vendors, you can bring best in breed and have a um, really like smooth experience if you're if you're working with modern providers um, and. That, so that that's something that thematically this year we're we're, we're focused on. Yeah, the the inspiration from for Money Legos came actually from Kevin Awaki, who is the founder of a crypto you know program called uh, Gitcoin, and it's this concept in in decentralized finance that you have all these open source tools like exchanges and you know wallets and treasuries. And you can kind of mix and match and plug and play to build your own financial applications on top of of this kind of core infrastructure. Um, and I think it's it it really translates well into kind of traditional, you know, traditional just financial services and financial technology as well, because you have your card issuing platform, you have your BAS provider, your, your banking as a service provider, you have all these things that you can build on top of and not start from zero, but, but builds with some tools that are already built and, and develop interesting applications on top of that to, to serve your customer segment. Um, and so, so yeah, I think that's super cool. That's super cool. It's interesting how the analogs, uh, go. Yeah. So did you, did you always know you wanted to start a company and how did you know you wanted to, to start a business and become an entrepreneur and and dive into the world of startups? Yeah, so I met my co-founders in high school and we were, we got to know each other just through building stuff together. And so I, would, I wouldn't say that we had this notion that, hey, like we absolutely need to start a company, but... Um, you know, it's it really comes from this you know place of like just enjoying the process of building things. I, I we didn't really overthink it too much. So you were building, you know, it sounds like you were building some projects and stuff in high school and some some maybe early applications from uh, from a young age. Yeah, we actually built uh, like an early file hosting company, and um, um, it was uh, to date myself a little bit. It was actually back. We were kind of competitive with Box when Box is actually a uh, consumer uh, offering. Ahead of the and, curve, uh, man! You you're exactly. competing with Box. You're doing card issuing before uh, before <laughs> Apple Pay is doing it. And I'd say like one thing that uh, was really exciting was sort of this like quick feedback loop of like uh, in, the, in the early days, like you would build something, you'd put it out there, and you'd just get like really immediate feedback and. Um, we were fortunate back then because uh, I think the the bar in some ways is actually um, a little lower. Um, there's way less competition, um, and so you have a couple of high school kids. I, I, even today, I guess the tooling has gotten better, but uh, back then it was um, it was a really fast feedback loop, which I think was what uh, got us into it. Mm-hmm. And so when when was that? Was that in high school? I was in high school. That was 2006. 2005. Very cool. And then, and then, so you went to uh, MIT, studied applied mathematics, and then graduated. And then, is that when you joined Hatch Labs? Yeah, I joined Hatch right out of college, and it was a really interesting setup. It was Hatch was basically this concept uh, of an incubator within a larger company uh, called IAC. Uh, IAC owns a bunch of internet properties uh, that used to own Match and have spun out Match. Uh, and the interesting thing about Hatch was like, it was this model where they incubated 10 companies and maybe it was like eight or nine, so- something on that order, a handful. And uh, pretty much all of them died uh, except for uh, except for one. And that one success was Tinder. Uh, and so that was kind of my first hand wow. exposure to rocket ship growth and, uh, you know, sort of startup 
uh, startup life. Where So what were you doing at Hatch then? Were you working on some of the projects they were incubating or were you working on internal stuff? What was your role there? I was working on a gaming app, uh, which uh, ended up not going anywhere, but it was a fun learning experience. Oh, interesting. So you, so then, so, so you joined Hatch as, um, like to take advantage of the incubator services, you were building your own platform. Was that with the same co-founder that, um, that you're working with today or different team? Oh no, I was actually an engineer there. Um, and so the, the app I was working on was a gaming app. It was a completely different team. So was it more of like a developer studio? Yeah, it was kind of an interesting model where there were a handful of uh, general managers slash entrepreneurs and residents. And then there was kind of a studio model uh, in terms of like, you know, uh, designers, engineers and other other folks. Um, and they kind of mixed things up and it was a really successful model, um, but pretty interesting to be be a part of. Got it. Yeah, that's really cool. And then did you jump from Hatch to start privacy.com? Yeah, so I left Hatch and uh, I think a lot of founders kind of go through this like period of like basically being in the desert and trying to ideate, figure out ideas. Uh, and I think about it kind of as the idea maze. Uh, so we went through the mm -hmm. idea maze and spent, I'd say a solid like year and a half or so uh, dabbling with a bunch of different ideas. Um, this is also around the time when like cryptocurrency was taking off. And so I uh, actually started, was was mining Dogecoin for a while, no uh, which was really fun. And um, yeah, eventually- What, what year was this? Idea Sorry. For, this was, uh, mining Doge was probably, tw was like early 2014. Um, Man. And uh, crypto was actually how I got interested in payments. Hmm this notion of like, it's kind of uh, crazy to think that you, know, you and I are talking to each other on what are effectively supercomputers. And, you know, in general, like when you want to buy something online, we're still kind of pulling out pieces of plastic and punching in 16 digit numbers into our supercomputers and cryptocurrency Doge in particular was really interesting because it represented this kind of uh, digital currency that was lightweight, it was fun that people were actually using. Uh, and that's that's really kind of what got me into uh, the world of payments. That's cool. I kind of I, I kind of came the other way. So I was so I came out of school and worked at an investment bank called Financial Technology Partners, and so got really interested in in payments and um, card issuing, merchant acquirers, you know, issuer processors, um, the likes of Stripe and and Square and and all these interesting companies. And, uh, and then I learned what correspondent banking was, and it's this like network of banks and I'm probably going to butcher it, but essentially if you try to, you know, pay a merchant in another country, your payment has to go through this network of five different banks before it ultimately settles in the, you know, the merchant's bank. And then crypto was booming in, you know, 2020, 2021. Yeah, I just got fascinated with the idea of this this global instant settlement layer that could circumvent this whole network of of seven different banks to process one transaction. Um, I think it, that thesis is still still needs to be proven out, but um, it's interesting to think about nonetheless. Yeah, definitely. I think the crypto space is is going to be an interesting one to follow uh, over the next couple of years for mm -hmm. sure. Yeah, absolutely. So you got interested in, in kind of cryptography and the payment, you know, Doge is a payment layer. And, and then did that lead to the interest in privacy.com or the, the inspiration behind privacy? So the original idea was kind of this card that you could uh, spend your digital currency uh, with. This was, you know, before the Coinbase card, before, um, uh, before any of the crypto cards. Um, the issue we ran into, we were at the time, I think, you know, a couple of 24 year olds and we were trying to issue this digital currency card. And so, uh, we probably talked to like 50 or more banks and, uh, eventually like, you know, basically got like a ton of no's and talked to, talked to someone who was like, Hey, like, why don't you all try to focus on like, you know, something that actually like 
people understand and you know creates value to the consumer and like you can always add in this crypto thing later uh and that sounded like a pretty good idea uh and frankly like we didn't we didn't actually have any other <laughs> options so it was really <laughs> the only idea and uh you know fast forward a couple of years and uh now we're here yeah how did you navigate the idea maze you know was there were there any like i don't know guiding principles or was it really like wandering around in the desert you know with your with a blindfold on um you know how did you make it out the other side with a product that that you found interesting and a co-founding team and all those things the founding team was pretty consistent and that probably really helped you know a lot of people talk about kind of this like finding product market fit and navigating the maze and i wish i had like a really you know sort of tight concise answer to this but honestly it's like a lot of iteration talking to customers uh following leads uh, you you are kind of wandering this maze and uh you can try to not retrace your steps too much but it's it's a maze and a lot of it's just like trying different things and seeing what works um i, I don't know if anyone's kind of quite cracked a formula for that for it but it was definitely pretty pretty random for us mm -hmm. I kind of hear a lot of advice that ideas are ideas are pretty much a dime a dozen and what really matters is the execution and the iteration and tweaking things so that customers actually want what you're you're providing and going through that motion you know it sounds like it's it's hard to skip the steps to you know come out the other side with with a product that has product market fit you have to go through the the iteration and the the grind, as it were. I, I definitely agree with that. I think a big part of that is like, you know, ultimately a successful product is a um, accumulation of a huge number of decisions. And it's hard to have like an idea that just works uh, perfectly. Like, I don't know if in the history of startups that has actually happened. Uh, if it has, I certainly haven't heard of it. Um, but it's really about kind of, understanding the fine grained nuance of your industry and the space that you're operating in and then kind of building a solution that uh, solves customer needs in, 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 in your space. And so um, I'd say it's it's like general guiding principle better to pick a space that you're excited about, but not be too, uh, too married to the idea. Mm -hmm. Be flexible and be be willing to change as you get customer feedback. Do you have any books or resources or articles that you think are interesting as it relates to entrepreneurship? Um, could be, you know, it could be a dead end and, and sorry if it is, but um, I'm reading, you know, I'm just now finally getting around to reading some VC books, uh, Zero to One and, and The Innovator's Dilemma by Clayton Christensen. And uh, I'm reading these books and I feel like I should have just read them way sooner because they have so many ideas that I've been struggling with, you know, for the past three years in venture, and they're just crystallized right there on the page. Um, but I'm curious if if you have any kind of books or articles or resources that you think are interesting as it relates to entrepreneurship. I think an age old classic that I I, I go back to um, every now and then is the um, uh, High Output Management by Andy Grove. Andy Grove. Highly, highly recommend it if you haven't read it, and it's it's um, worth rereading. A more sort of modern one that uh, really resonated with me, at least, was uh, Amp It Up. Yeah, if you, if you want that sort of extra shot in the arm, it's just a really good good one to read uh, for me. Yeah, that's great. So high output management and and Amp It Up, we'll add them to the good reads. Do you have any advice for for founders or would be founders that might want to? build in fintech or or start a startup in general um you know any advice that you would give folks who are thinking about it iterating on ideas trying to navigate the idea maze i think advice is really tough to give in general this is a little meta but the best uh the best I've, advice i've gotten is really around that of uh, like you know take the advice uh sort of in context and you know relative to uh who you are like for example, you know, you'll have certain folks that say, hey, like, you know, like never do any press, right? Or like, you know, just focus on the product and like, that'll be okay. But like, you know, if you're a product focused founder, like, you know, every now and then like press is like, you know, 
is worth getting and like worth going for it for that you know validation your customers are probably reading um you know the the news or media in one form or another so like it's not it's it's really hard to kind of be absolute with advice so much of it just depends on the individual situation Mm -hmm. yeah oftentimes you you get what you pay for when uh when you're asking for advice yeah building in fintech is is unique because you're building such mission critical infrastructure that drives really critical processes for for your end customers you know are there is there a different approach for building in fintech or different kind of things you need to think about um, because you're building that that critical infrastructure for your customers um, and then you know how do you manage how do you manage the stress around um, delivering for your customers and ensuring that um, they can continue their operations in a in an easy way. Um, so that was kind of a word word jumble and an unclear question, but um, feel free to bite off any of that uh, if you uh, if you understood it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. I I, th- I think you know maybe the gist of it is yeah, it's you know fintech fintech is definitely high stakes, um, and, and you know you're you're trying to innovate, but like you really can't move fast and break things uh, because the stakes are so high, right? And I think the way I think about it is like, it makes like problem selection and like complexity management even more important, right? Like if you're a, I don't know, I don't want to pick on any particular sector, but like, you know, let's say you're building something where like, you know, the stakes are like less low uh, or less high. Um, you You can afford to maybe like, be a little less disciplined in certain areas. Now, on the other hand, like the competition is probably s- stiffer. And so there's, there's no like kind of like perfect world here, but, um, no free lunch. I think, I think in FinTech particularly, like in particular, like you have to kind of hold steady. Like there's certain things that you just can't break. Um, but you can be pretty disciplined about like the problem that, that you're solving. And that's why like for us, like we've been very focused on card issuing. We're, um, and, and we want to go really deep and build that infrastructure versus trying to kind of do everything else, right? And there are certainly counterexamples, uh, but oftentimes the counterexamples are uh, folks that have done a really good job selecting vendors to work with that give them leverage in differentiating in other areas. For example, if you're a neobank that is in like a bunch of different countries, um, sometimes it's because, like you know, you're you're leveraging uh, infrastructure that um, allows you to run a lot faster. Mm-hmm. What's the mission statement of of Lithic? We talk that our our goal as a company is building uh, financial infrastructure that just works. And the idea is like you know, it's like similar to uh, other things in our life. Like you know, our our financial infrastructure should just work. Like you know, you shouldn't have to worry about hey, the the, the reporting you know, spit out the right amount of dollars in settlement, did the money move when I, you know, called the API, like it should just work. And um, it's it's kind of uh, mind boggling, but that's that's not fully the state of the world today. Yeah, absolutely. And there's still so much more room to grow for financial services that, that just work. Um, a lot of stuff is, you know, getting paid for with, with checks and, there's a lot of pen and paper still in in a ton of different industries, and so financial infrastructure that just works is is a good good motto. Are there specific kind of like verticals or segments that you're excited about, uh, you know, for the future of of Lithic or or any kind of you know markets that you think are going to achieve growth for for your business um, going forward? I'll go back to like what what the the Mark Andreessen quote about software eating the world. I think it's pretty indisputable that software is eating the world now, um, and and is continuing to eat the world. I think the next couple of years you're going to see like a lot more embedded payments use cases come out um, as you know software eats the world. Mm-hmm. And my sense is like even though this has been an ongoing trend, it's something that we'll continue to see. Absolutely. Embedded fintech is has been so interesting to watch over the past, um, you know, really the past multiple years. 
just because you have all these new software platforms that have done a great job of filling a customer need and acquiring a huge installed base of customers. And then FinTech just represents another vector of growth um, and another piece of value that you can deliver to an existing customer set. So I totally agree there. I think the other thing is you're going to actually start to see like checks in ACH uh, decrease in, in volume and usage. And net-net, I think that's going to be a positive for uh, end customers. It's just a much better experience. Like, things work reasonably well once they uh, go digital and, you know, over over card rails. A lot of times, like, you know, the pain of, like, you know, chasing down checks, figuring out reconciliation, it's like, because these systems aren't digital. Um, and you have to, like, kind of bug someone and say, like, hey, like, you know, did you get my check? It's exciting to think about... Uh you know, full digitization of, of these types of things um, in a world where everyone's using more, uh, you know, more tech enabled solutions than, uh, than, uh, than checks. Um, well, awesome. Yeah, I certainly had a, a good time and really enjoyed the conversation. So thanks for joining us. And yeah, we appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Greg.